Okay, brothers and sisters of Christ, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. We're going to continue on in 2 Thessalonians with the expository study. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. <clears throat> We're going to stop there. And we're going to talk about let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you. I was just reading in the Psalms. It is better to put trust, the trust at the Lord than to put confidence in man. Okay. If I can see where I can find it when I was reading it. But it was in Psalm 118. Here it is, verse 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust the Lord and His Word than to trust mankind as the coal. And we've talked about this, brother, Jesus Christ, when it comes to man's wisdom, the world's wisdom versus God's wisdom. It's better to trust God. He knows better. He knows the right way. He knows what He's doing. When it says it's better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in princes, it's talking about uh, people in authority, leaders. Today be our government. It's better to trust God than any government, any any power whatsoever, leaders of today. It's better to put trust in, in God. Okay? But you see, let no man deceive you by any means. Okay? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure, endure, Sound doctrine. It's important I threw in endure because would we also read there falling away first? We have to endure sound doctrine when Jesus comes back the day of Christ. When Jesus comes back, the catching away of the body of Christ. We have to endure sound doctrine until then and make sure that when Jesus comes back, we're in a standing position, not a falling position. Endure sound doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. What gets in the way of this right here, brother says Christ? What, do you guys remember the three enemies? What are the three enemies, brother says Christ? The flesh. We just read here, but after their own lusts. The flesh. The world. Satan. Those are the three things that get in the way of good, sound doctrine. They get in the way of absolute truth. I know great men of God that have fallen away and are no longer good stewards of the Scriptures. Why? Because their flesh gets in the way. The world gets in the way. They're starting to do things Satan's way and taking Satan up on his offer when he goes, Hey, I got an offer for you. Knocks at the door and says, I got an offer for you. They take their offer. They take his offer and they fall away from this. He offers them something they want. Lust of the flesh. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. What does that mean to have a teacher that have itching ears? What that means, brother says Christ, is that you'll listen to somebody that tells you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. That's the teachers having itching ears. Oh, he says what I like. He's okay with my sin. He's okay with how I want to do things. He's okay with us being worldly. Going after the flesh. Ah, oh, he, he tells me what I want to hear. But this is Christ. You need to find a good preacher that tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And you need to find a good preacher that doesn't twist the scriptures so the scriptures tell him what he wants to hear. Okay, I've seen brethren do that. They, they used to teach the truth. God, show me what I need to hear. Show me what I need to see. And now they pervert the scriptures and wrestle the scriptures to their own destruction and make it say what they want it to say because it pleases them. Having themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. In other words, they were at the truth. And then they turned from it. They were standing for truth and then they turned from it. What is that? The falling away. Right? And shall be turned unto fables. But you've got these wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, teachers that are preaching the, the there's a preaching flesh, justifying the flesh, 
justifying the worldliness, doing things the world's way, justifying doctrines of devils, which we'll get into. They have teachings that are doctrines of devils. And they're deceiving people. Let no man deceive you by any means. Romans 16, 17. Romans 16, 17 we read, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. And avoid them. That includes brothers in Christ. They could be great men of God, having great teachings, but the moment they start turning their back, especially turning their back on the day of Christ is at hand, the day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ, it's at hand. It can happen any day. We're supposed to be looking, present tense, for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. We're not to be entangled with the affairs of this life who have chosen him to be a soldier. You avoid them. They teach a false gospel. Avoid them. Stay away from those. I'm a King James Bible believer. But they don't preach repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, He's, you throw your old man at the foot of the cross and God gives you a new man. The new birth. The new life. And what's that new life in? Christ Jesus our Lord. Sanctification. God cleans up your life afterwards. There's a changed life. Avoid them that preach false gospels. Avoid them that go against, well, uh, go against being sealed into the day of redemption. That you're eternally secure. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Avoid them. I've talked to some brethren when it comes to the Godhead versus the Trinity. If they don't believe the Godhead of the King James Bible, God in the person singular of Jesus Christ, and Him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Jesus has three parts. God the Father is in Him. The Spirit of God, the Father, is in him. The Holy Spirit, he's the body. He is the Godhead. Jesus is the, the Godhead personified. There's brethren like Peter Ruckman, Brother Peter Ruckman. He believed this. He just used wrong words sometimes and got messed up because he was trying to bring Trinity in and, and kind of mish the, the, the terms that you use for the Trinity and trying to mish it in with the Godhead, and he'd make a mess sometimes. But he taught this. He taught that the Godhead is Jesus Christ. Body, soul, and spirit. These three are one. Okay? When you have people that just hardcore for something that's false, you're to avoid them. People that are against dispensational teaching. Teachers that are preaching against dispensational teaching, stay away from them. People who preach like what we're talking about here, that the body of Christ, telling these Thessalonians, they're telling the Thessalonians, hey, um, the catch away of the body of Christ already happened. Or they come in and say, it, it, it won't happen until halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. Or it doesn't happen at all. Or they're telling them that the day of the Lord already happened. Because there's a, a false religions out there that tell you that the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven, when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns for a thousand years, that already happened in the past. All these things are lying. Avoid them. They're lying. They're deceiving. Avoid them. The catch away of the body of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. And it hasn't happened yet. And the time of Jacob's trouble happens before the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord hasn't happened yet. The time of Jacob's trouble hasn't happened, the day of the Lord hasn't happened. Okay? You're to avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. We're going to come back to that verse. Because okay? I keep saying, how do you keep from being simple? Okay. Actually, let's do it now. How do you keep from being simple? Go back to Psalms. We were just, Psalms 119. Go down to Beth. The Psalms 119. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. And there's different parts. Aleph. Go to Beth, verse 9. Okay. Deceiving the hearts of the simple. You have brethren out there, not brethren, you have some brethren that are falling away, but you have wolves in sheep's clothing out there that have their own agenda. It's about this a lot of times. Trying to make money or having power. The Nicolaitans lording over the, the Lord's heritage, lording over the flock. I have power and authority and I'm the boss. <laughs> 
you're not the final authority. You're not supposed to be the boss. Jesus is supposed to be the final authority. His word is supposed to be the final authority. And you're supposed to be a servant, not the master of the flock, servant to the flock. Okay? But you got these guys, they, they serve their own bellies. All right? These fools in sheep's clothing, they're on their way to hell, and they're going to try to drag as many people with them. And if they can't, they can't prevent anybody from getting saved, so what do they do? They try to mess you up, brothers and sisters Christ. And they go through good words and fair speeches. And there's a lot of brethren, I believe, get really messed up doctrinally. They get messed up in instruction and righteousness. They get messed up when it comes to dispensational teaching. They're not doing it properly. Why? How? It says here, they deceive the hearts of the what? The simple. Why are you simple? Well, let's read this real quick. Psalms 119, 9 through 16. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By doing whatever that man behind the camera says. By doing whatever that man with a nice suit and tie behind the pulpit says. Finding a teacher that tells you what you want to hear. Having a teacher with uh, itching ears. Letting me do whatever I want. No. What does it say here? By taking heed thereto according to thy Word. I say this verse a lot, brother, says Christ, because it's so important. How do you keep from being a simpleton? How do you how do you keep from being deceived? This is how. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. How do you seek the Lord today? Through his word. I'll prove it right here. I, I, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. How do you seek the Lord with all your heart? Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. By hiding God's word in your heart. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. What Jesus said? The comforter will come. And he'll guide you in all truth. It takes the Holy Spirit to open this book and clean up our lives. And get us to line up with this book. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. What does the Bible say we're supposed to do? Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. With my lips I declare all the judgments of thy mouth. 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Preaching the gospel. Being a living testimony as well as a verbal testimony. Being a living witness as well as a verbal witness. Verse 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. These people here that are... Um, by, with their own bellies and by good words and fair speeches to see the hearts of the simple, they're preaching the flesh's way, the lust of the flesh. They're preaching the world's way. They're preaching Satan's way. And those three ways appeal to the lost world. And some of those ways, when it comes to the lust of the flesh, will, will appeal to our flesh. And our flesh says, oh, come on, it's not that big. I'm not supposed to be doing things the, my way. I'm not supposed to be doing things the world's way. And I'm not supposed to be, definitely not supposed to be doing things Satan's way. Doctrines of devils. Which way am I supposed to be doing, brother, says Christ? Which way are we supposed to be doing? I will meditate in thy precepts. This is how we know which way we're supposed to be doing. And whose way is it? And have respect unto thy ways. We're supposed to be doing things God's way. And these last days, it's hard. the body of Christ is in a mess. We're not really doing things God's way that much. We're so spread out. There's, few, there's fewer and fewer of us that are still standing. There's few of us that are actual Bible-believing, I believe, God-fearing uh, men, actual Christian men, according to the Scriptures, saved, born again, compared to the world's population. I always did, I'm just going to throw this out there. The world's population is like 7 billion now, that, so they say, so they say, Let's say it's 7 billion. Let's say 4% of that is saved, actual saved sinners. 2% are standing. 2% are, I'm just going to go 50 50. 2% are standing, 2% are falling flat on their face. We're spread out, we're spread thin. But we still need to do our best to do things God's way, brother, sis Christ. If it be possible, you need to do things God's way. Now, when I say if it be possible, God will make almost everything possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Okay, 
All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. God will open doors and God will close doors. But what I'm mainly talking about, I keep thinking of a house church. You know, you're supposed to have bishops, plural, deacons, plural, uh, ordained elders, plural. This is how the body of Christ is supposed to come together. We're all spread out thin, brother, says Christ. God has us spread out for a reason. I believe it's because the catching away of the body is just around the corner. We're supposed to be a light to the world. If all the light's in one place, the rest of the world's just going to be darkness. He has us spread out, so the light is the God's light shines through us. It's supposed to shine through us because we're doing things God's way. We're a living testimony, a living witness. Not just a verbal. And we're a light to this world all over. Verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statues. I will not forget thy word. Brothers and Christ, we have to stay in this book left and right. I'm going through this book all the time, listening to it on Alexander Scorvey all the time. I'm doing Bible studies. I do my morning reading. I do my evening reading. I talk to the Lord about the Word of God all day. I've got to work hard to keep this in my heart. Thy Word have I hid in my heart. Why? Because for some reason, I've watched, uh, I can watch a Hollywood movie once, and that movie sticks with you for the rest of your life, mainly because it's images, but it sticks with you the rest of your life. I can read this book a million times, and if I put this book down and go six months without reading it, I'll forget a lot that's in here. I'll forget it. Why do you need to stay in the book day in and day out? So you don't forget it. You keep it fresh in your heart. Why the preacher is supposed to be preaching this, the, the doctrines? He's supposed to be preaching the teachings over and over and over, so he doesn't forget it. There's some brethren that, that's the dangers of video ministry. I'm sorry, brothers guys. I'm not against brethren who have video ministries, but that's one of the dangers of video ministries. You put out all, I've done a hundred teachings on this subject. I'm done, I, I'm done. No, you need to keep teaching it to keep it fresh in your heart and to keep it fresh in the brethren's heart. Well, they can go watch the video. Stop being, how do you say it, lazy. Stop, you need to preach. Brothers says Christ, brethren that are in ministry, they need to be preaching the teachings over and over and over to keep it fresh in their hearts. I know some men that have turned their back on absolute truth. Why? They stop preaching it. Oh, I've got plenty of videos. They stop preaching it. They stop keeping it fresh in their own heart. How do you keep from being simple? Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How do you keep your hand there? Okay. How do you keep from being simple? I'm sorry, go to 1 Timothy 4.1. Turn to chapter 1 Timothy 4.1, but keep your hand in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But how do you keep from being simple, brother, says Christ? By st staying in this book and hiding it in your heart. And when someone comes around with a lie, with the doctrine of devils, trying to promote the flesh, trying to promote the world, idolatry, worldliness, you say, ah, uh, no, you're wrong, this is right. Get away from me. Get away from me. Avoid them. Get away from me. 1 Timothy 4, 1, we read, Now the Spirit, capital S Spirit, Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, falling away first. Remember what we read in there? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, what's that day? We're going to talk about it again. The day of Christ, the catch away of the body of Christ shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay. Now, I believe that falling away happens, then we're going to read about how he who now let will not will let till he be taken out of the way, and then the man of sin is revealed. It's a three-part step. Paul is just giving us a little bit. You want the real outline of what's going on. It's Revelation. John writes to us in Revelation and lets us know a lot more about the time of Jacob's trouble. And even Revelation isn't in chronological order. It's not. Okay. He just, Paul is just telling us a little bit about what's going to happen after we leave. We get caught up. Okay. The man of sin is going to be revealed. I'm getting ahead of myself, but he's going to set himself up as God to be worshipped as God. He's going to be a fake Jesus, and the world's going to buy a hook, line, and sinker. 1 Timothy 4.1 Like I said, now the Spirit speaks lastly and specifically. That now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits? These are saved people, I believe it's talking about. It's the falling away. 
seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I got it. I got kind of butted heads with the brother in Christ because he's saying, "No, the falling away is just you know, brethren that uh, that uh, you know, it's not brethren. It's false converts. That's the falling away. All these false converts are turning from the truth." No, they were never in the truth to begin with. And I quoted that verse to them, that they went out from us, but they were not of us. Therefore, they can't be part of the falling away because they were never of us. They were never in a standing position to begin with. They weren't standing for the truth. Some come in, wolves in sheep's clothing, and they come in and pretend, yeah, I believe as you do, I'm one of you. And when the time's right, they go back to what they really believe, and they try to take as many of the flock with them. That's their ploy. That's how they. That's their. That's how Satan works and his ministers work. They come in. I'm one of you, and they've got a profession, a worldly profession, just words, saying, "Hey, I believe what you believe." And then they turn and go to the side and go, and they go, "No, I've always believed this, and you guys need to come believe this too." And they pull as many people away. They, Paul talks about false converts. That's not part of the falling away. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They never fell from us because they were never of us. This is talking about brethren that are of us. They do believe this truth. But over the years, brothers is Christ, we're going to get into this, the whole armor of God. Over the years, they started turning their back on this book. They started taking the pieces of the armor of God off. They started get, being seduced by spirits, evil spirits. The Antichrist spirit that's in the world today. And they get turned over to doctrines of devils. They turn their back on the truth where they once believed it, actually believed it, stood for it, lived it, and they turn their back on it. How many of us know brethren out there, especially men in ministry, that have done that? In these last days, it just seems like we're dropping like flies. When you know, if you know what that saying is, flies only live 24 hours. When you hit that 24-hour mark, the flies just start dropping all over the place. But the point is, is we're dropping, brothers of Christ. We're falling. A lot of us are becoming part of the falling away. I'm, gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself, but doing all to stand. Stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. Second two, speaking lies. These people that turn from the faith. They were in it. They were of us. And they turn from the faith. And they give, give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I've said this before real quick. Not everybody that's teaching or standing for something that's wrong, I don't believe they're all lost. And I've said this before. Some, I believe, are. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're lost. They're not Bible believers. And you need to stay away from ministries that we've proven that they're not Bible believers. You need to stay away from them. All right? That being said, when you're dealing with somebody that's in this condition, you know what the solution is, brother, sister Christ? Sp verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know what you do, brother, sister Christ? You go back to step one. What's step one? The gospel. I'm not preaching the gospel because I believe they're lost. I'm preaching the gospel because they need to be reminded of who saved them, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. They've forgotten who it is they serve. They're starting to serve the flesh. They're starting to mess up the scriptures by just serving the flesh. Trying to get the scriptures to tell them what they want to hear so they can have the flesh. They're serving the flesh. They're serving the world. Ignorantly, they fall into the trap, the snare of the devil. His fiery darts of the wicked. He's supposed to have that shield of faith. The armor of God. And they fall into doctrines of devils. They fall into serving the devil. They're just, I believe they're safe, brethren, that have done that. <clears throat> Today, the biggest push is, is when you see that, they're automatically lost. Everyone's lost. Anyone who's off on anything on the Bible, they're automatically lost. That's not always true, brother, says Christ. The Bible says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. That goes for both saved and lost. When we instruct somebody with the truth, that we see, we have, and we talked about this, there's a difference between someone who doesn't want the truth and someone who wants the truth and it's messed up. Speak not to a, uh, speak not a fool and his folly. Okay, so, answer, sorry, answer not a fool and his folly, and then answer a fool and his folly. How can you discern between the two? Do they, do they, do you see a little part of them that wants the truth? 
They want the truth. They might be very messed up, but they want the truth. They have, you see a little love of the truth in them, and they're actually seeking God, they're seeking the truth, in meekness instructing them that impose themselves. First Timothy 4, 6. Turn to 1 Timothy 4, 6. Or just jump down to 1 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, sometimes you first, when I see someone that's off doctrinally, or they're getting into sin and wickedness, lust of the flesh, worldliness, and they're trying to pervert the Bible to justify sin for a season, to justify worldliness, the first thing you do is you put them in remembrance of these things. Uh, brother, you're straying from the Word of God. If they're a man in ministry and they're perverting the Word of God, you can warn them. You're not supposed to add thou not unto his word lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Brother, you're not being a good steward of the Scriptures. You're getting into lusts of the flesh. You're getting into worldliness. And you're perverting the Scriptures to justify your sins. You remind them what the Scriptures actually say. But in meekness. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay. Then you rebuke them before all and you say, I'm done with you. Avoid them. Avoid them. If thou be put, put in... This is for brethren. You avoid them right out if it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, someone who's lost. And be careful. Brother says Christ, be careful. Today the push is just that everyone's automatically lost so you don't have to confront. Confrontation isn't fun. And it ain't easy. It's not fun, and it's not easy to stand up to a brother in Christ, especially someone you love, someone you respect, someone who's a mentor, maybe. Someone who's like a father in the faith. It's hard to have confrontation. So what has people been doing today? They've just been trying to avoid confrontation. How do they do it? They just make out everyone to be lost. Everyone that's messed up, everyone that's wrong in any area, instead of being able to confront you with brotherly love, I'm just going to act, treat you like you're lost. Kick you to the curb. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. You go to him with brotherly love and meekness and say, look, here's the truth. Brother, you're straying from the truth. You're failing the Lord. Nourished up in the word of faith. In the word of faith. Nourished up. you got to stay in this book. You have to keep hiding it in your heart. you got to keep going through this because... You gotta remember it. It's easy for you to forget this. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained. Right, brother Sir? Paul is warning that he's saying, let no man deceive you by any means. Why? Because he's always telling us that, brother says Christ. Remember what Paul said he prays night and day in tears? Why? He's talking about wolves in sheep's clothing coming in. And he says, I, I cease not to pray for for the brethren, night and day with tears. Why? Because brethren are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in and messing up the brethren. He's begun a good, God has begun a good work through Paul in the brethren, and Satan and his ministers are coming through and messing it up. And what's going on here, what I believe is, is Paul's been preaching that the catching away of the body of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm sorry, catching away the body of Christ, then the time of Jacob's trouble. We go home before the time of Jacob's trouble happens. And you get these wolves in sheep's clothing coming in saying, Oh, no, the catching away of the body of Christ doesn't happen. Oh, the day of Christ, we're going to get to that, that for that day, this is the next part. Oh, the day of Christ is just, you know, it's the second coming. It's the second coming. I talked with some brethren in the comment section. I hope the brethren were doing their studies and reading the Bible. And I kind of pointed them in the right direction. Okay? The day of Christ... And the, and the day of the Lord are two separate events. And the easiest way to remember that, one might do another study, just a short study on the side. The day of Christ, okay, has hope, is about hope and redemption. And we've already mentioned verses in, in I think, part one. It's about hope and it's about redemption. When we were lost, we were without hope and without God in the world. When God saved us, He gave us that hope. This isn't it. We're going to go home someday to be with our Lord and Savior, and we're not going through that time of Jacob's trouble. We're not appointed to God's wrath. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right? That's the easiest way to remember. The day of Christ has hope and redemption in it. The day of the Lord has God's wrath and God's vengeance in it. 
the day of the Lord. We already missed it. That, uh, we already read a verse in part one where it talked about they shall not escape. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as it cometh upon a child, and they shall not escape. And it uses the day of the Lord. Just to help you out, brothers and Christ, they're not the same event. Post and mid-tribbers, these wolves in sheep's clothing teachers come in and try to say they're the same. They're not. You have brethren that have turned their back because it says the day of Christ is at hand, which means the catching away of the body of Christ, we're supposed to live as if it can happen any day now. Get busy living for the Lord. Get busy in the, get this Bible hidden in your heart. Get busy in prayer. Get busy in the ministry of reconciliation. Get busy in the, in the, in the life of sanctification. Letting God clean up your life and doing right by God and pleasing God. You better be treating the brethren right. You better be treating the lost world right. You don't reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And true love for the lost world is preaching the gospel to them. Okay? Some brethren have turned on that, and they turn their back on the day of Christ being the catching away of the body of Christ. Why? Because it says it's at hand, and they don't want to believe... I, I got corrected. I said eminent return. So if I slip up again, forgive me. But the day of Christ at hand, they don't believe that the catching away of the body of Christ, that we're supposed to live as if it can happen any day. I always say you can get caught home in death any day, and you get caught home in life, the catching away of the body of Christ. Either way, you get caught home any day now. You need to be living for the Lord, not being distracted by the world. You got these wolves in sheep's clothing coming in and saying that the day of Christ has already happened. It won't happen until halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, no, no. It won't happen until the very end. We go up and come right back down. Uh, it doesn't happen at all. There's some people that say the day of the Lord. It's already happened. The false religions it already happened. No, it hasn't happened yet. Okay. But that day, just so you know, brothers and Christ, that day is talking about 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Go back up to verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, were they being shaken about. People are telling them they're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Nor by letter from us that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is our gathering together with him. And I've proven this. Day of Christ is only mentioned three times in the Bible. Those specific, the specific, the day of Christ. Twice in Philippians, once in, in Thessalon, 2 Thessalonians. At the first in the Philippians, it's clear as day. It's talking about the, the, the church is, it stays, is here up to the day of Christ. What is the day of Christ? It's the catching away of the body of Christ. Then we get to 2 Thessalonians, and now all of a sudden says it says it's at hand, and you have brethren that are turning their back on it being that it can happen any day now. All of a sudden, now the day of Christ has to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. No, it is not. No, it is not. Okay? Titus 2.12, we're going to go through once again, just to encourage. This is to encourage. We don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. The day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ, 2 Titus 2.12, teaching us that... The whole point of looking for that blessed hope, brother says Christ, is to live a life of Christ until he says, okay, you're done, come home. It could be in death, or it can be at the catching away of the body of Christ. You're to live for Christ with all your heart, brother says Christ. What's supposed to be in your heart? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. What did we just read it up there about? Let no man deceive you. The lusts, their own bellies, and good words and fair speeches. There's oh, 2 Timothy 4 3, that's what I'm looking for. It says up there, for the time will come when they not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. I was looking for the word lusts. Shall they heap to themselves teachers having its in years? Teaching us, back to Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know one of the reasons why Satan wants to take away that the, 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 the catching away of the body of Christ happens any day? Because you're not doing this. You're not denying ungodliness and worldly lust. It gets you to drop your guard. Oh, well, Jesus isn't coming back for another four or five years. And every man I've heard say that, that once believed in the, uh, that the day of Christ is at hand, 
their life is just falling apart. They become very fleshly. They pervert the word of God now. They're just lust of the flesh. They're ungodly. They have idolatry in their life. Worldly lusts. You're supposed to be on guard all the time. We're, fight, we're, we're doing job for the Lord. We're, we're soldiers of Jesus Christ, good soldiers of Jesus Christ, until He calls us home. And we don't know when that's going to be. So we're to live every day. Paul tells us we're to live every day as if it could happen tomorrow. And you got people that come in and try to take that away from us, brother says Christ, and mess you up. 13. This is how you look, looking for that blessed hope. How do you look for that blessed hope? Teaching. You have brethren that's in the ministry that they teach. They preach. The ministry of reconciliation. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Telling us that we're supposed to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Until God calls us home, we're supposed to live for Him every day. He calls home any day. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity. He might redeem us? I always throw that in there, might. He's talking about the catch away of the body of Christ. Remember, brothers and sisters, this is all these teachings I've done before. The law of sin and death. If you're under the law of sin and death, the word death, that means you're going to hell and the lake of fire. That's where you're going because you failed the Lord and you've sinned against Him. One sin makes you worthy of hell, fire, and damnation. One sin. When we get saved, death gets dropped. We're still under the law of sin. We're still in this wicked body of flesh. I still have to repent daily, brother says Christ, daily. You say, what kind of a wicked... I'm not, I, when I got saved, I was the chiefest of sinners. Sorry, Paul, I was the chiefest of sinners. I'm not saying that's wrong. What Paul was saying was is that when God saved him, he's the chiefest of sinners. And if God can save him, he can save you. People misuse that verse. They take it and try to say today, as a saved sinner, you can be the chiefest of sinners. No, no, no. There's supposed to be a changed life. Paul said, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's talking about at salvation, he was the chiefest of sinners. After God saved him, God showed him how to live, the, the right doctrines, what to believe, where he's supposed to be standing, and how to live. Back then it was the verbal word through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles. Today we have it through the written word. Okay. Who gave himself, but he might redeem us from all iniquity. The Bible says in John that if, if we repent... He is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who's the us? Save sinners. It's addressed to save sinners. I'm still under the law of sin. This wicked flesh, I get thoughts I'm not supposed to have. Sometimes those thoughts turn into actions and I fail the Lord physically. What do we do? We repent. And God forgives us and gets us back on the right path. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow Jesus. Follow me. The Bible says, your cross daily. we got to repent daily. we got to put the flesh down daily. But there's going to come a day that he might, it says here, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. The might there isn't saying it won't happen. It's saying it might happen in your lifetime, the catching away of the body of Christ. It might God's guaranteed, when He calls us home, He's going to take this wicked body of flesh, because we're going to get to that verse, and give us a new body. And He's going to do away with sin in our lives, period. No more lust of the flesh. No more struggling with the flesh. But I wanted to point that out, that He might redeem us from all iniquity. What's Paul saying? The catching away might happen in our lifetime. He was for it. Don't listen to preachers that have turned their back on, on the day of Christ is at hand. Oh, no, Paul wasn't looking for it. Yes, he was. There's plenty of verses to prove it. They just hardened their heart and turned their back on the Word of God. And purified unto himself a pure, peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. No, it says, and purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We're going to be serving the Lord for all eternity. Are we supposed to have some of this attitude now, be zealous of good works today? We're gonna keep, we got to keep putting the flesh down. we got to keep coming to God in repentance so He can clean us. But there's going to come a day where He's going to purify us completely. The catching away of the body of Christ. 
Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. The trump of God is the voice that God makes. A trumpet, we've talked about this. If you want to go watch that video about the trump of God, because a brother asked about it. It says trump of God is the, it's the sound that the instrument makes, but I don't think it's going to be like an actual trumpet sound. I think more than anything it talks about how trumpets are used. They're used in battle. Why? Because it projects. When Jesus comes in the cloud and he calls us home, the whole world will hear it. The whole world will hear it. Victoria's up and walking around again. The whole world will hear it. Give me a second. Sorry about that, brother. The whole world will see it, or hear it. The whole world will hear it. It will project, okay, the trump of God. That's what it is. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's what I mean, brother. Everyone gets to be part of the catching away of the body of Christ. If you don't live, if God calls you home in death before the catching away of the body of Christ, you're not going to miss the catching away. Everyone is going to see it. Paul's going to see it. He's going to be a part of it. He's going to see it because he's a part of it. Everyone's a part of it that's saved and born again from the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the catching away of the body of Christ. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the, them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What is this? This is that day. It's the day of Christ. How do we know? Verse uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that the day of Christ is at hand, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And that day of Christ is at hand. It's talking about the catching away. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 51. Paul talked about the catching away. He pushed it. He was looking for it. He was trying to be ready for it. And then he got told he was going to be he was going to be a martyr. He was going to be killed for the word of God and for his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he says, "My for my departure is at hand." He got told he was going to be killed. People take that and say, "Well, see, he wasn't looking for the blessed hope. He wasn't he wasn't looking for that the day of Christ to be at hand because he got told tomorrow we're going to kill you." That's a, that's a poor argument and, and no foundation whatsoever. If I got told that we're going to take you out and burn you at the stake tomorrow, I'd write letters to brethren saying, hey, my departure's at hand. They're going to kill me tomorrow. I'm not, that doesn't mean I don't believe in the, the blessed hope that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul believed it. Brethren that have forgotten that, brethren that have turned on it, you need to turn back to the truth. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall be put on immortality. I long for that day, brothers of Christ. Do you long for that day? Do your actions say you long for that day? Remember, what, what is looking for the body, looking for that blessed hope? Looking for this to happen. We're living a life of Christ. We're keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's how you know you truly long for it. That, I know some people that they get into a, I just want to go home, I just want to, and they're moaning, they're whining, they're complaining, and they're not getting much done for the Lord. That's not really wanting to go home. If you really want to go home, you need to get busy for the Lord and living for Him every day. Prayer, Bible reading, fellowship, preaching the gospel, gospel tracting, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, showing true love for the lost world by preaching the truth to them. 50, verse 54, So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Remember, Jesus Christ overcame the law of sin and death. Death gets swallowed up in victory. Then does the victory, 
get really happen to catch away the body of Christ. Now, I know I'm not under the law of sin and death now that I'm saved, and brother says Christ, neither are you, but the true victory over the law of sin and death is at the catching away of the body of Christ. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You know one of the uh, enemies that, uh, that Jesus overcomes is death? That's the final enemy that Jesus overcomes. At some point in, the, in, in this world's history, it's going to be after the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven, where Jesus rules for a thousand years, Satan's let loose for a little while, the kingdoms come against him, he destroys the heaven, old heaven and the old earth, and he creates a new heaven. There's a judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the great white throne judgment. Then there's the new heaven and the new earth, and in the new heaven and new earth, there's no more death. There's the tree of life, and we get our life from Jesus Christ. But this is a victory because he's overcome death in the life of saved sinners. O death, where is thy victory? O death, the thing of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law of sin and death. But thanks be to God which gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That day, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And there's a comma there. Falling away first. What's that falling away? That's brethren. We're going to be reading some verses over. Please forgive me, but I really want to drive this home because there's brethren that are forgetting this. There's a falling away today, brothers says Christ. Are you becoming part of it? I've got brethren that, that I believe are saved that they're coming across prideful, vanity, envy, bitter, hateful. And it's just like, Brothers and sisters, Christ, you're probably part of the falling away. The Bible says we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Even if you have to break fellowship with them, you still do it in meekness and with love. Sorry, brother. This is right, and I can't go the direction you're going. You don't beat them down. You don't call them names. You don't mock them. Okay? You don't promote backbiting and whispering. Brothers and sisters, Christ, you don't. You don't fall away from the truth in the stands. You don't start getting back into the flesh. I know some brethren that struggle with the flesh, but there's some brethren that have gotten back into the flesh and they justify it. They try to pervert the scriptures to make them feel better about what they're doing. You're becoming part of the falling away. You're falling away from that standing point that God set you in when he saved you. I've always said this before. You have brethren that get saved and they run 100 miles an hour and that 100 miles an hour, what I mean by running, the Bible talks about running the race as if one receiveth the prize. That running is sanctification. Learning the Bible. Learning the doctrines in the Bible. That's the running. They get on fire for the Word of God. They get on fire for cleaning up their life. And they're running and they're running and they hit that first wall. Bam! Whatever that temptation is. The lust of the flesh. The worldliness. being The temptation of the world. You hit that wall when... Living for Jesus Christ and standing for Jesus Christ is going to cost you something. And you hit that wall. That can also be the wall. It's going to cost you something. It could cost you a wife. It could cost you a husband. It could cost you your children. It could cost you friends and family members. It can cost you your job. It can get to the point where it can cost you your very life. But they hit that first wall, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they fall and they don't get back up. They're fallen. They're part of the fallen away. They don't get back up. They start putting this to the side so they can stay in their fallen state. But there was a changed life. There was a changed life. It was there. Even if it was just for a moment, it was there. What do you do when someone gets in a hardcore fallen state? What's, what do you do? It's my advice to you, brother says Christ. What do you do? You go back to step one. What's step one? The gospel. That's why I'm all for preachers preaching good teachings on salvation, even if they're preaching to save sinners, to remind them of, of who saved them, the condition they were in before they were lost, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. Turn to 1 Timothy 4, 1 again. We're going to read this one again. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They were in it, and they fell. 
This is the falling away, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I threw that in there because these are examples, forbidding to marry and abstaining from meats. In other words, what they're doing is, is they're falling from what this says is okay. The Bible talks about, I will therefore that the women marry, bear children, and guide the house to protect them, to have a head covering to protect them. You know, the Bible talks about how the, they're supposed to have a head covering to protect them from the angels. There's something about a woman without a man and authority over them to protect them and provide for them and to wash them by the watering of the word that women are getting tempted by Satan and devils. Okay. But he says, I will, therefore, that the, the women marry. You don't have to. But he talks about marriage. A, a, a bishop is the husband of one wife. You don't have to be a husband of one wife to be a bishop. But if you do get married, you have only one wife. But it's promoting marriage. What's going on is you have people that turn from this. They depart from the faith. They turn from this. You're allowed to eat any meat. As long as you pray over it and it's not been offered unto idols and you pray over it, all is being received with thanksgiving. And the, and the, and the, and the meat is sanctified by prayer. Right? But what happens is you've got people that start turning on the book. They once stood for it and they turn on it. That's the falling away. Don't let any man deceive you. Oh no, the falling away is just, you know, this or it's just that or it's just, you know, false converts or this. I'm sorry, I disagree with some of the brethren. That's not it. The falling away is saved sinners turning their back on the truth and turning to lies. Start going for doctrines of devils. Is that happening today? A lot. Like I said, I believe over half the body of Christ is in the fallen state right now. Why? Because they worship the man behind the camera. They worship the man behind the pulpit. Why? Because he tells them what they want to hear. I, I got back into this sin and wickedness, and I want to keep it, and I don't want to be convicted, so I, I dropped this man over here that, conde that convicted me of my sin through the scriptures, and I went for this man over here because he's okay with it. Gal that's, that goes on a lot today. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Turn to Galatians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I always thought, why did he say not of men, neither by man? Because there were some people being told, we're getting told like by Peter when they did the lot, here's the third, here's the twelfth apostle. That was by men. That wasn't by Jesus Christ. Paul was chosen by Jesus Christ to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I always say that because it's a great greeting. It's a great uh, salutation. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It reminds me that that's what I need to have. That's what my hope is for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. And not to get into the bitterness and the hate and the, and the anger without a cause, and the pride, and the envy, and I start mistreating the brethren. And, the Lord, or, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Might? Might? What's Paul saying? Catching away the body of Christ. Right now, brother says Christ, I'm only two-thirds redeemed. I'm still in this body of wicked flesh. I'm still having to deal with this present evil world. Once again, here's another verse that Paul's saying, God could come back any day now and take us home. Now he can take you home any day in death when you start getting older, or you might end up having to die for Jesus Christ like Paul did, like a lot of the brethren down through the centuries have, the last 2,000 years, a lot of martyrs for Jesus Christ, killed for him. But we are, we always teach, I always teach Brother Jesus Christ and other brethren have always teached that line up with the Bible that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. 
God has set us apart. Be ye separate. Come out from among them. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We are not to be of the world anymore. God pulled us out, but we're still in the world. It says here that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of our Father. What did, Jesus, what did Paul tell us here in verse, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2? As that the day of Christ is at hand? That's how Paul lived. I think that's one of the things that made him... He was, a, he, was a, he was an apostle to the Gentiles, but what made him the greatest man of God that you'll ever come across in the, in the time of the Gentiles in this dispensation is because he was passionate about looking for that blessed hope and living your life as, God, as if God could take you home any moment. I need to get busy for the Lord. I think what also helped is Paul got a glimpse of heaven you guys remember that story where it talks about how he talks about, I knew a man once, whether out of the body I cannot tell, whether in the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And he talks about how he got caught up to the third heaven and he saw unspeakable things. Of him will I um, glory, but, not in, but not, in, not in my flesh. I'll just glory in my infirmities that keep reminding me that this isn't it. We're going to go be with our Lord and Savior someday. He got a glimpse of heaven. And he said that to be in heaven would be far better, but to be here with you, brothers, says Christ, is much more needful. To preach and exhort and encourage the brethren to stay on that narrow path, to be a living witness to the lost world for Jesus Christ, was much needful. That's why we're still here, brothers, says Christ. But he had that motivation because he got a glimpse of heaven. We need to have that motivation, even though we haven't had a glimpse of heaven. We need to have that motivation that Jesus Christ can come back any day now. I need to keep living for the Lord, and I need to make sure I'm standing. That I'm not part of the falling away. Let's keep going in Galatians, verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you giving God glory in all things? Are you giving Him thanks in all things? Are you giving Him praise in all things? Bless, are you given honor? Blessing and honor and power be unto our God forever. Verse 6. I marvel that ye, so, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Falling away. Some are fake. I understand some. There's false converts. Paul talks about wolves and sheep's clothing and warns it. We just talked about uh, not being deceived. Let no man deceive you by any means. Wolves in sheep's clothing, ministers of Satan. But the falling away is talking about brethren. Those ministers of Satan that are doing the deceiving, they're causing brethren to fall away. I marvel that you've so soon removed, removed, in other words, you were in the standing point, but you're removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There be some that trouble you, let no man deceive you. Paul warned of wolves in sheep's clothing. He prayed for the brethren night and day with tears. But removed. They were in a standing point. Oh, maybe repentance wasn't required. I did it. And, you know, I don't really, I don't regret doing it. But maybe it's, it's maybe it's not part of salvation. A prayer. I did it. I did it to get saved. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. But, you know, and I don't regret doing it. I did it. And that's how I got saved. But maybe it's not really necessary. Or in this situation, I did those things, and those are the things that were required, and God gives me a new life afterwards. But someone tells me that's not enough. What's the next thing? Which, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They pervert the gospel of Christ. Why? Because they're coming in there and telling them, You've got to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. The gospel that you came to God broken in a broken, contrite spirit in true biblical repentance, having sorrow for your personal sins that you sinned against God, 
and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer, asking God to save you, that was good, but it's not enough. That's what's going on here. They're falling away thinking that they have to work, not start earning salvation or they got to work hard not to lose the salvation that was given to them. This is the falling away. Ephesians 6.10, Ephesians 6.10 we read, Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. To stay away from the doctrines of devils, the wiles of the devils. Once again, brother says Christ, how do you keep from being part of the falling away? Taking God's word and hiding in our hearts. If you have to, pause the video and go back to Psalms 119 and read verses 9 through 16 again. Is that you? Are you or, or is this setting over somewhere and it's gathering dust? Are you putting on the whole armor of God? This teaches us how to put on the whole armor of God. This reminds us that we're supposed to be making sure we keep putting it on. It's something you have to put on every day, brother, says Christ. You start your day, you put on the whole armor of God. Every day, you go through, okay, do I have the whole armor of God on, and do I have it on properly? Ephesians 6, 12, 17, oh no, sorry, sorry. Um, Ephesians 6, 12, let's continue, Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan is no moral. He transforms himself into an angel of light. He's not an angel. He's a fallen cherub. But why does he transform himself into an angel of light? He's trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. He's an angel, the angel of the Lord, that man. He is an angel of the Lord. Satan isn't. But it's no moral that his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They're lost. They're on their way to hell, and they're going to try to drag as many people with them, and if you're truly saved and born again, they're going to try to mess up as many saved brethren as much as they can. That's where our fight is. We're not supposed to be entangled with the affairs of this life when they're fighting over land and money and power and, and trying to promote sin and wickedness just with the lost world as a whole. Yes, we point out their sin. Yes, we say because of their sin they're going to hell. We point out their sinful, wicked condition and where they're heading. But we can't change the world. God, only Jesus Christ can. When's that going to happen? The day of the Lord. Remember the day of the Lord. His wrath, his vengeance. He's going to come back and he's going to rule with a rod of iron and he's going to set things right. Only Jesus Christ can make the world right. We can't. All we can do is be a light in this dark world so those who want the right, who want absolute truth, who want to go to truly want to go to heaven the right way, we're here to be a light for him. Uh, and Peter, it says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. That hope, that blessed hope. I had a fire here um, a few months, or not a few months, it was a few years back. I've, I've been here a while. I'm thinking three or four years ago, we had a fire come through here and I had to evacuate and I got interviewed by one of the news, local news, and the guy was asking me, why aren't you afraid? Why aren't you scared? I was able to tell him the hope that was in me. God's got everything covered. If I lose everything, God knows what he's doing. And this world isn't it. Someday I'm going to go home to be with my Lord and Savior. And I get to spend eternity with my Lord and Savior. Before I got saved, I was going to end up spending eternity in hell. In the lake of fire. I was able to witness to the guy. What he see in me, he saw the hope that was in me and he asked. I need to be ready to give an answer. Brother says, Christ, you need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you, the blessed hope. We're going home someday to be with our Lord and Savior and to, and to serve Him in heaven and paradise for all eternity. Well, how do I get there? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I got there. You need to do the same thing. And that's where the gospel comes in. Spiritual weakness in high places. Verse 13, wherefore, we're supposed to fight the, the spiritual wickedness in high places. We can't change the world. What we can do is be a light for the truth. 
and shine light on darkness. We can shine the truth on false, true doctrine on false doctrines. The truth on lies and deception. We show the, tr the light of truth on all these lies and, de and deception that's being pushed out there. Absolutely. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand, stand, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. What's the opposite of standing? Fallen, flat on your face. The falling away. And people don't see it. Some brethren can't seem to get that. Standing, falling. Standing, falling. It's not that difficult. Okay? In order to fall, be part of the falling away, you had to be in a standing position. And Paul is warning that there's brethren that are falling, and you need to stand. And here's how you stand. You put on the whole armor of God. Stand, therefore, having your loins squared about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, above all, take in the shield of faith. You know the first piece of armor that gets put down, brother, sister, Christ? I kind of gave it away already. It's that shield of faith. Your faith in the doctrines, your faith in, the tr in this word, that it's perfect, it's right, the way it is. You start messing with it. You start changing it. Why? Because you put down that shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Why? Where, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. You put down that shield of faith. What are the fiery darts of the wicked? Doctrines of devils. Lies. Deceptions. Lusts of the flesh. Satan uses lusts of the flesh to get you to get you to fall. He uses wiles of the world. The wiles of the devil or the wiles of the world. He uses uh, worldliness and idolatry to try to get you to fall. That's what all those darts are. And you're supposed to keep that shield up, brothers and sisters in Christ. What happens when the falling away? Brethren, take down that shield. What happens when you put down that shield? You don't keep your sword sharp. Sometimes you even put the sword down altogether. Then what happens? You take off that helmet for a hope of salvation. A hope of salvation. Looking for that blessed hope. You stop looking for the blessed hope. I've seen it in the brethren. They've turned their back on the day of Christ is at hand. They've turned their back on it. They've taken off that helmet for a hope of salvation. They let Satan come and steal their crown. That's one of the crown rewards is that you're looking for that blessed hope to the very end. Whether you get caught up in life, I mean, sorry, well, both. Whether you get caught up in death or you get caught up in life at the catching way of the body of Christ. Let no man steal that crown. How is all the falling away even happening? People are taking their shield and they're putting it down and all these fiery darts are coming in. They're not keeping this in their heart. They start forgetting it. And when someone comes in with good words and fair speeches, they're easily deceived because they've forgotten the Word of God. They've forgotten the stance they once took. They should have been taking it all the time, but they stopped. Ephesians 6.17, and take the helmet of salvation. It says helmet of salvation here, but another part of Scripture it says a helmet for a hope of salvation. I'm eternally secure right now, okay? I'm sealed into the day of redemption. When it comes to eternal salvation, I'm, 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 and I've got that. But the helmet is a hope of salvation from this life that he might, remember it said, might deliver us from this present evil world in Galatians chapter 1. That he might Deliver us from this present evil world. We have the helmet for our hope of salvation that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We keep living for Him every day until He calls us home. Someday, He's going to call us home in death. But He might, we might get to live to see the catching away of the body of Christ. And get our new bodies. Take a helmet for a hope of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I've always said this, brother and sister Christ. You pray. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. You're to pray over this book. You're to pray over the brethren. You're to pray for lost people that you want to see get saved. I want to see them all get saved, but you, sometimes you have specific lost people in mind when you're praying. You're to pray for God for your own walk with the Lord, which is praying over this book. Lord, help me stay in this book. Hide God's word in my, your word in my heart and live it. You need to have a strong prayer life, brothers and Christ. Another thing that happens when you put down that shield and you got all these fire darts come in, 
Oh, you say prayers every once in a while, but you don't have a strong prayer life. The Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. Do you talk to the Lord all the time about your life, about His Word, and making sure your life lines up with the Word, about the brethren? Do you talk to the Lord about the brethren? It's prayer. Anytime you talk to the Lord, it's prayer. Talk to the Lord about the brethren? Do you talk to the Lord about what's going on in the world? And helping you be a better uh, witness for Him? To lead people to Christ? And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. This guy's watching. I've always said this. Watching. We're not looking at the lost world, watching, trying to see if we can see the time of Jacob's trouble or aspects of the time of Jacob's trouble. We're looking at the world and seeing how bad it's getting and saying, I could go home to be with the Lord any day now. I need to get busy. I need to stay focused. That's what the watching's for. Notice what it says there. It says, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're to exhort each other and encourage one another. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Look how bad it's getting out there. Look how bad it's getting in my area. It might not be that bad in your area, but look how bad it's getting in my area. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, and we need to get busy living for the Lord. We need to get busy being ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. We need to live for Jesus Christ every day. It's a motivation. Now, I put this in my uh, notes, Brother Christ. If you take off even so much as one piece of armor, and it usually starts with that shield. It does. That's why Paul said, above all, taking the shield of faith. That shield usually is the first piece of armor that comes off. And when that shield comes off, the next piece comes off, then the next piece comes off, then the next piece comes off, and the next thing you know, you're not wearing any pieces of the armor of God. That's why it says put on the whole armor of God. Not just a piece, the whole armor of God. And when you take off so much as one piece, brother, sister, Christ, you become part of the falling away. It's guaranteed. Now, you don't have to remain part of the falling away. I've taught you, I've told you how to get back up. You fall down, this is how you get back up. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. If you've turned on, on true teachings, get back to the right teachings, the right doctrines. Get back to those stands. Get back to living for Jesus Christ. You're no longer part of the falling away. I do, I do not want to be part of the falling away when Jesus comes back or calls me home. There's times I was. There's times I was falling flat on my face. As the Lord came back, He would have caught me in a fallen state. I'm talking about when it comes to the flesh, my struggles with the flesh. Doctrinally, praise God, I've been off in a little bit here and there. God straightened me out and ironed me out. But brothers and Christ, we do not want to be in a fallen state when Jesus Christ comes back to call us home. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, why did Paul say this? Be steadfast, unmovable. Sorry. The dogs jumped. Standing position. Stand, having done all to stand. When you find the proper standing point, you're to stand there and you're not to move. You're not to budge. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I believe because brethren are, are, come, are not being moved, they're being movable and they're not being steadfast. Being swayed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Being like a fish out of water. Well, first I'm over here in this group, then I'm over here in that group. and then I'm part of the body of Christ, period. This is my foundation. And I'm telling you right now, brothers and Christ, in these last days, it's a lonely road sometimes to stand for God's Word with the falling away happening. It's a lonely road to stand for God's Word. And I pray that God gives you the courage, gives you the strength to stand for it. And not let you, and for you not to compromise so you can be part of this group over here or be part of that group over there, that you don't compromise. Here it is, Ephesians 4.14. I did put it in my notes. Ephesians 4.14. Remember, you can pause the video and turn, because we're going through a lot of scripture. Pause the video and turn. I always do that. These videos, no matter how long they are, they end up being twice as long sometimes, because I like to pause and turn to the scriptures. You need to do that. 
Because that helps you get the scriptures in your head and in your heart the way God has done it in mine. Okay. Ephesians 4.14 That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know, there's children. It talks about that we henceforth be no more children. Being a child of God. Son, now are we the sons of God. Talking about being saved. You have brethren that are saved that are being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Yeah, Paul has to come in and warn them. You don't want to be like that. Stop doing that. The falling away. It was slowly happening in his time. But the falling away more than anything in these last days is people just turning their backs and going back to the world. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. I've pointed this out, brothers. There's that cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. I'll give you an example of a cunning craftiness. I knew a brother in Christ that he took a word in the Bible... He replaced it with another word that he liked that made him right, not the word of God right, him right. He wasn't lining up with the word of God. He got rebuked and corrected by brethren. And he didn't, he, you know where he got this technique? He got this technique from the lost world, servants of Satan. But he took a word, replaced it with his own word, and then gave the definition of that word, and then acted like he was just telling you the definition of the original word. He wasn't. He replaced the word God chose with his own word. And then gave that definition. And then he says, I line up with the book. Cunning craftiness. Slight of men. Whereby they lie and wait to deceive. There's men that add to the word of God, subtract from the word of God. But they act like, oh, this is perfect in everything. Oh, but we use words that aren't in the Bible. Oh, we use words that aren't in the Bible. We use all kinds of words. But this word is perfect and without error. And we're not to add to it, we're not to subtract from it. It's perfect from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's perfect. Then why do you add, use words and terms that aren't in the Bible? Stop to think about that, brothers of Christ. Why are they using words and terms that aren't in the Bible? Descriptions and terms, titles that aren't in the Bible. Why? Because they don't believe this book is perfect 100%. Or, they've been spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. Yeah, they believe this is perfect, but they've gotten spoiled. They're slowly becoming part of the falling away. They got spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, I say it because it's just tradition. After the rudiments of the world. And what is it? It's not after Christ. Brothers and sisters of Christ, be careful. Be careful about the catching away. Okay? Sorry, this one's a little going a little bit longer, but I just really want to get into this stuff to preach and encourage you, but don't be part of the falling away that we're reading about there. Okay, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now we're going to get into the man of sin, the son of perdition. Turn to John 17, 12. Son of perdition. Who is the son of perdition? What does it mean to be the son of perdition? It's not, to be honest with you, it's not any specific person. I'll prove it. Okay. John 17, 12. We know there's one in Jesus' day. There's a son of perdition in Jesus' day. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So here we hear about the son of perdition. Who's he talking about? Judas Iscariot. And as we get into this, I want to make a point. I don't believe Judas Iscariot was a bad man from the beginning. I believe he started out, okay, this man is a prophet. He called me. He's saying truth. I'm believing that truth. I'm following this man. But somewhere along the way, he became very fleshly. The Bible says he had the money. He kept the treasury of all the donations. He kept the money. Somewhere along the way, he got very fleshly, very worldly, very messed up. But he still wasn't the, the son of perdition yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. Turn uh, to John 6, 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in the spirit. Remember, we talked about this. And testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. You know what troubles my spirit? When brethren turn on me. Not disagree with me. Turn on me. Name calling, backbiting, whispering, bearing false witness. Just having nothing but hate and bitterness for a brother in Christ. 
They turn on you like ravening wolves. It troubles my spirit, especially if it was a brother in Christ that's like a brother that was closer than a friend, a friend that's closer than a brother. The Bible talks about in Psalms. There's still a lot of brethren that turn on me that I pray for them. I pray for them all the time. I want to see the brethren come together to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. Verse 22. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when you shall betray me. Verse 22. Then the disciple looked one at another. The disciples looked one at another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Who knows who that is? Anyone? Anyone? A lot of you probably guessed it. It's John. Not John the Baptist, but the John, the, the, the apostle that wrote the book of John. He wrote the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he, he, God wrote, gave him through the Spirit. But we get God's Word through him in these books and Revelation. That God gave him the, uh, let, let him see, get caught up in the Spirit, not in the flesh. In the Spirit, he was caught up in the Spirit. And let him see the catching away, the, the, day, the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, the new heaven and the new earth. Amen. That's the John that this is talking about. Verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is in whom I give a shall give a sop. And I've learned great teachings from brethren that sop, if you break it apart, S-O-P, that's the abbreviations for son of perdition. To whom I give the sop. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. People say, well, see, Judas Iscariot. Wait, wait, wait. When did Judas Iscariot become the son of perdition? Here we get it in verse 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. That man of sin be revealed. Remember we just read there. That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. When Satan gets, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but when Satan gets kicked out of heaven, turn to Revelation 12, 9, we'll read about that. When Satan gets kicked out of heaven, he will enter that whatever man he chooses. Right now, the brethren are getting distracted. I think this man could be the son of perdition. I think, this, I think the son of perdition is here today. He just hasn't been revealed. The son of perdition is not here today. Because he doesn't become the son of perdition until Satan enters into him. And Satan probably has five or six, seven, ten men he can choose from. Trust me, there's plenty of wicked men in this world. Plenty of wicked men in this world. He doesn't become the son of perdition until Satan is kicked out of heaven, comes down, and enters into him. Then he becomes the son of perdition. Okay. Revelation 12.9 and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When he's cast out and comes down, then the man of sin is revealed. Here's Once again, here's the timeline. We're in the time of the Gentiles. We're having a falling away right now, a huge falling away. People are turning from the truth. There's such division, I'm telling you, there's such division in the body of Christ today that wasn't even thought of or heard of in Paul's day. He talked about it, I can't say heard of, but he talked about it, but if he saw the, 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 the vision that's in the body of Christ today, he would marvel the way John marveled when he saw Mystery Babylon. He'd marvel, I cannot believe it's gotten that bad. Oh yeah, that's right, Paul, to, uh, Paul would be like, God told me about the, uh, the falling away and I shared it with the brethren. It's that bad? Yes, the division is that bad. That's the first step to the, to the, is the, the falling away. And when the falling away gets to the point where God says, enough is enough, he who now let, I'm getting ahead, we're going to get to that verse, he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Who's the let? Who's the he that's letting? The body of Christ. So you have the falling away, the body of Christ leaves, then the man of sin is revealed. Satan's kicked out of heaven and comes down, and the man of sin is revealed. He enters the man of sin. The son of perdition is not here today. The man of sin is not here today, period. Because he doesn't become the man of sin until Satan enters him. Okay. 
9. Don't get distracted by looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for the catching away of the body of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. This man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan's kicked out of heaven. He enters into this man. What does he do? He starts his campaign. Now, I don't believe this is all in perfect chronological order. We get, uh, and even Revelation is not in chronological order. But you got the man of sin comes down. He first presents himself as the man of peace. And he goes and tries to set up a one world order. A one world kingdom. A one world religion. The first three and a half years is him coming as a man of peace. And he brings war. He promises peace, but he brings war. He's a man that's enlightened. He's a wise man. He's just a wise man. Almost like a prophet. For the first three and a half years. But three and a half years in is where we're getting to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple as God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? The temple gets rebuilt. I believe this the rebuilding of the temple. Keep people keep looking for the rebuilding of the temple so then we can go home. I don't believe the temple is going to get rebuilt in our in, in the time of the Gentiles. I believe it gets rebuilt in those three and a half years. They can have that temple up like that. I believe it gets built then. That man of peace, the prophet, we need to have this temple built, and he brings peace. He promises peace. He makes it, he, he confirms a covenant. That's a whole other study. But he gets rid of the Muslims. He gets rid of uh, all these false, these, all these, he brings all these religions un, unto Rome, which I believe, believe is going to be the one world religion, Catholicism. But he brings them all together, and they build the temple. Okay, when they get that temple built, the, the sin of oblation is going to happen. And that sin of oblation is that they're going back to doing animal sacrifices. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. For the time of the Gentiles, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He was also the ultimate sacrifice for the Old Testament saints. The people, we talked about this in Abraham's bosom. They couldn't go to heaven until the ultimate sacrifice was done. The perfect sacrifice. I say ultimate, perfect sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The perfect sacrifice. But you have this man who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Three and a half years in, he's going to cause all the animal sacrifices to stop. And he's going to set himself up and say, actually, I'm God. I'm Jesus Christ. I'm your Messiah. I'm the Christ. Turn to Isaiah 14, 12. Turn to Isaiah 14, 12. What is this thing about he opposed himself, this man of sin, the son of perdition? We already talked about Satan enters into him. So it goes back to Satan. What is Satan's ultimate desire? Isaiah 14, 20. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Remember, it's not morning star. It's son of the morning. Angels are star, and Jesus is, the, is an angel of the Lord. Satan likes to counterfeit him. doesn't say morning star. It says son of the morning. It's got to point that out. How art thou cut down to the ground, which does weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Angels. I will sit also, and I always say this real quick. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. We talked about this in other studies. What does Satan offer the world? He offers the men of this world that, hey, you can be worshipped as gods. You can be as gods knowing good and evil. He always worships, he, I mean, he always offers people godhood. He offers angels, the third of the angels that come down that we read about being kicked out. He offers them godhood. But who's always above them? He wants to be above them. He'll, he offered Jesus Christ to, that the, he could have the world. The world will worship you and you can have the world. But you have to worship me. And what did Jesus say? Thou shalt only worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall they serve. But he's always promising. He exalted above the stars of God. He promises those third of the angels, I believe, they promise that you'll be worshipped as gods, plural. But you guys have to worship me. I'm above you. I will sit also upon, upon the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like the Most High. That man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan enters into him, starts building and getting everything set up. That's like I said, I believe building the third temple. And while the third temple is being built, he's going out raging, uh, waging war. He promises peace, but he brings war. And he's trying to bring the whole world under him. And God lets it happen. You're going to have a one world order. You're going to have a one world religion. Okay. You're going to have a one world currency, the mark of the beast. You have to take the mark and worship the beast. Okay. It's going to be there. I'll be like the Most High. Verse 15. What's going to happen to him in the end, though? And can I get an amen? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Where's Satan's ultimate destination? The lake of fire. And we had studies on this, that the, the lake of fire and hell were not prepared for mankind. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But what do we read? He is God. In 2 Thessalonians, He is God. Sitteth in the temple of God. The temple of God, the physical temple. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, that's how we know the body of Christ isn't going through. There's another verse, but we know the body of Christ is not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. What's going on here? They're trying to deceive him, they're thinking that the catching away already happened, and you're in the time of Jacob's trouble, or the catching away doesn't happen until after, like halfway through or at the end of the time of Jacob, that the body of Christ goes through this time period. But this says he said it in the temple of God. There's going to be a temple, a physical temple, that's God's temple, because when Jesus comes back and kicks Satan out, he takes over. There's going to be a temple of God in the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost, and to be without blemish. Right. Matthew 24, 15. Matthew 24, 15. This is a warning to the Jews. In the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven... When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Flee to the mountains. You keep reading, talk about fleeing to the mountains. He that be in Judea, flee to the mountains. What does Satan do? He sets himself up as God. Is that happening today? Because i got to go back to one of the reasons why I did this study was because someone's taking some of these verses and saying that's today. Is that today? Is there a physical man, an antichrist, that antichrist that shall be revealed, a physical man that's claiming to be Jesus Christ? We have men that claim to be Jesus Christ today. Yes, we do. But that man of sin, the son of perdition, is there a temple? No, there isn't a temple today. That he sets himself up into and that the whole world buys it look, hook, line, and sinker. That this is Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the Jesus we've been waiting for. This is the Christ. And the whole world worships him as a whole for the most part. There's a few that don't. There's a small, 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 small remnant that doesn't. But the world as a whole worships him. Is that going on today? No. Be careful not to take these things and say that's for today. It's not. That's for the time of the Gentiles. That's for the body of Christ. We're going to be going through that. We're not. Get back to 2 Thessalonians 2.5. This is Paul's attitude. We're almost done with this part. With this video for this part of the expository study. 2 Thessalonians 2.5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? You mean sometimes we've got to be told things over and over and over and over? We need to read this over and over and over? Why? That's why we don't forget. We keep it hidden here. Something doesn't come in and knock the Word of God out. We come in and take the Word of God, put it in here, and knock some bad things out. Praise God. And God cleans up our life. What happens when you start letting bad things back in? You take down that shield. It knocks the good stuff out. The Word of God. we got to stay in this book all the time, brothers is Christ. All the time. He said, remember not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Paul told the Thessalonians before that we will not go through the time of Jacob's trouble. We won't have to see this man of sin, the son of perdition. We won't have to go through this time period, the day of the Lord, where it's God's wrath and God's vengeance is being poured out. 
this time period where you, there is no seal, you're not sealed into the day of redemption, you have to endure to the end, and then shall you be saved. You're not saved until the end. You can't be present tense saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. You mean Paul told them? Turn to 1 Thessalonians. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Praise God. Amen. A lot of brethren out there have testimonies how they were part of false religions, organized religions. How God got them out of idolatry. Uh, the best way I'd say with idolatry is you have addictions. And those addictions are idols because they come before God. And God goes, oh, I need, God says, no, I come first. And you say, Lord, I want you to come first. Take control. Give me strength to get rid of all these idols, all these addictions. Man, praise God. Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, we're to wait. And there's some verses that say patiently waiting. Some of us get antsy. We want to go home. We want that catching away of the body of Christ to happen right now. It could. I believe it could. That's why I'm doing this. I'm doing the work of the Lord. But until it happens, we patiently wait by living for Jesus Christ. But it says here, And we wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What's that wrath that He delivered us from? The time of Jacob's trouble. God's pouring out all His wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 Jump over to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. The day of the Lord is equivalent with God's wrath. The day of Christ is attributed to the hope, the blessed hope. Saying that uh, redemption, we're going to be redeemed. That blessed hope. The day of the Lord, God's wrath. God's vengeance. But we're not, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. We won't be going through that time period. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he said that, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Why would he say it like that, brother Jesus Christ? Let me tell you why he says it like that. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you obtain salvation by enduring to the end. You have to endure God's wrath God's vengeance being poured out on this world for seven years. You have to have that faith, and you have to keep God's commandments, and you have to endure to the end. But God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we're sealed into the day of redemption. We've got that seal. At the time of Jacob's trouble, there is no seal. Paul's saying, you don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not appointed to God's wrath. But you have these teachers having itching ears, these wolves in sheep's clothing come in. Oh, no, there's really no wrath until the very end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The first seal that gets opened is unleashing the, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Who opens that seal? God does. Unleashing the man of sin, the son of perdition, on this world who promises peace, but he goes around and brings war, and he brings a lot of death and destruction. But that's not God's wrath. No, 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 that's not God's wrath. Yes, it is. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. Go back to verse 1. Backtrack on that same chapter, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that that day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, the day of the Lord. At the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus comes back, this is the second coming. But what is it likened to? Let's keep reading. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travaileth on a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Jesus comes back. He's pouring out his wrath throughout the whole, whole time of Jacob's trouble, but he's going to come back, and you have that 250, that, that, I think it's 200 million men army, Sometimes I get the numbers mixed up. And the Bible talks about one is taken and one is left. One is taken and one is left. They're so desperate, they're taking anybody that can fight. 
One's taken, one is left. And it says, where, Lord, where the eagles are gathered together? It's talking about the battle, the great battle. Jesus comes back oh, with a sword comes out of his mouth and wipes out that 200 million man army. And the eagles that gather together, the birds feed on their flesh. What is the day of the Lord likened to? God pouring out his vengeance, his wrath. Destruction. That's the easiest way to tell them apart. I had a brother to help me with that study. To tell them apart. The day of the Lord, God's wrath, God's vengeance, the destruction. The day of Christ, that blessed hope, redemption. The day of Christ is a good thing. I mean, it's a positive thing. The day of the Lord, before he sets up his, he comes back to set up his kingdom. It's always likened to he comes back. He's got to do. A, he's going to be pouring out his wrath, his judgment, the time of Jacob's trouble, preparing this world for the kingdom of heaven. He's preparing his kingdom. He's getting the world ready. It's, 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 it's hard. They shall not escape. Here's verse 4. But ye, brethren, ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief in the night. Why does that day not overtake us as a thief in the night? Because we won't be there. We're caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Falling away, catching away the body of Christ, the seal is open, and that first seal is unleashing the man of sin, the son of perdition, He's revealed, and the time of Jacob's trouble starts. And once it starts, the Bible says, unless those days be shortened, no, no flesh should be saved. God has to shorten those days. You still don't know when Jesus is going to come back exactly. You don't. The days are shortened. It doesn't say how short the days made him, or God made him, or how short the year he made the years, or something like that. It doesn't tell us. So once again, you don't know. You can't set the clock and say, seven years from now, God will be back. It doesn't work that way. When God comes back, it's going to be as a thief in the night. It's going to catch them by surprise. You know why the catching away of the body of Christ is not supposed to catch us by surprise, brothers and sisters Christ? And it's going to catch a lot of brethren by surprise. Why? Because they're not looking for it. We're supposed to be looking for the catching away of the body of Christ. We're supposed to have our eyes on Jesus Christ. Through His Word. Living a life of Christ today. We're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. So when he says, Philip Newton, come up hither. Yes, Lord. He can do it right now. I'd be like, I'd be like, yes, Lord. I get to go up. But there's going to be some brethren that are indulging in the flesh, lust of the flesh, uh, worldliness. They're doing things the wrong way. They've wronged the brethren. They've wronged the lost world by not preaching truth to them. And they're just living. And God calls them. They're going to be like, I, uh, uh, as uh, imagine someone getting caught up and they're trying to grab this stuff to clean up. It's too late. I'm trying to clean up all this mess and all this sin. This way. It's too late. They get caught off guard. But this is talking about the day of the Lord. We're not going to be there. That's why we're not going to be... Uh, the day is not going to overtake you as a thief. It's not going to overtake us as a thief. All right? And these, that's what leads us into verse 6 and 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 